Hello, welcome to um, the second part of our series of lectures on volcanoes. This is Volcanoes Part 2. Um, so in this lecture, we're going to think about the products that come out of a volcano, the materials that come out of a volcano, and the, the hazards associated with, with them. Um, essentially, we're going to talk about the ways that volcanoes can kill you. <laughs> um, so in this opening slide, which you've seen before is you can see lava coming down the sides of the volcano um, and stuff being ejected up from the crater um, into, into the air. Um, this, this lava and, and fragments of molten lava and ash clouds behind. So this stuff that's thrown into the air is, is collectively called what we call pyroclastics. We'll come back to these words, but pyroclastics literally means pyrofire. Clast is fragment in geology, so fire fragments. Um, all right, and you get various types. Okay, so we're gonna go back to those series of questions we can use for um, all hazards uh, in hazard analysis. So we talked about um, in the last one about um, what's the geologic process. It's all related to um, plate tectonics. Uh, where does it occur? And the different styles of uh, different types of volcano like shield volcanoes or composite cones um etc um, um in this uh talk we're going to talk about basically um how bad is it um and what sort of material is it um the type of lava um the existence of pyroclastics or not etc and in the final part three which will be the next lecture to follow in this one uh we'll talk about how we forecast um um volcanic eruptions, uh, can we, first of all, uh, is it possible to? Um, and we'll talk about the hazard maps and what we can do as individuals, what we can do as a community to kind of mitigate against the uh, the risks. Okay, so um, how do volcanoes kill? Uh, using this word eaglet again, so just going through them again, um, explosions, so volcanic bombs and debris, and we'll be learning about most of these words um, um, in this talk, in this lecture. Ash, which is a hazard to airplanes, especially uh, jet aircraft. If it gets in the engine, it causes something called a flame out. Well, it basically switch the combustion engine off. Um, and, it can all, and basically ash is, is pulverized rock. Um, so when it builds up on, um, on, top, on top of buildings, especially flat roof buildings, uh, it can cause building collapse quite easily. Um, something called lahars, which is associated with ash, basically they're volcanic mud flows. We'll talk a lot about those. Um, gases are emitted from volcanoes, like poisonous gases, like uh, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide in high concentrations, um, sulfur dioxide, etc. And also something called these pyroclastic flows. Uh, these are very super superheated um, volcanic uh, debris flows, essentially um avalanches of superheated gases and dust but uh, we're talking very very hot thousand degrees celsius um sort of 1800 degrees fahrenheit and um they can move at several hundred miles per hour um lethal essentially lava um so this flowing rock in in fahrenheit around about 2000 degrees fahrenheit or thereabouts about sort of 1100 1200 celsius um and other I won't talk too too much about these last two um, earthquakes. Um, we mentioned in the last one when lava or magma starts to build up underneath a volcano, um, it causes a lot of pressure on those rocks as, as that magma reservoir fills up underneath the volcano, and that can cause stresses, which can cause uh, small earthquakes. And sometimes you can actually get hundreds of small earthquakes, generally small ones, uh, prior to an eruption, a few days before an eruption. And um, that's a big red flag, a precursor uh, that there may be an eruption on the way, um, these uh, swarms of, of small earthquakes. Um, tsunamis, uh, again, we won't talk too much about that. We, uh, we will talk more about tsunami when we, when we look at earthquakes. Um, tsunamis are usually caused by seabed earthquakes displacing the water, but also, uh, which I've mentioned, uh, Krakatoa, the volcanic eruption in the uh, 1800s in Indonesia. That was a volcanic island when that erupted. Uh, that caused a, a tsunami, uh, displaced the water essentially and caused a rippling, uh, a, a very high uh, amplitude wave. Okay, so um, volcanic eruptions can be very explosive, as we've learned. Remember, they're more 
viscous lava, especially sort of continental settings um, where there's continental lithosphere being uh, derived uh, from the magma, uh, that can give cause a very, very uh, explosive eruption, such as in the United States, uh, for example, in the Cascade Mountains, uh, such as uh, this image of uh, Mount St. Helens erupting. Um, so here you can see various hazards coming from this volcano. Um, there's a volcanic plume which goes this mushroom cloud that goes vertically up and all of that ash essentially will come back down to earth at some point and that in itself is a hazard and we'll go through that. Um, and here uh, Mount St. Helens did have a lateral blast as we've learned. Uh, there was an eruption in, in one direction due to a landslide just prior to the eruption so the eruption column actually kind of went sideways slightly but also Mount St. Helens had um, other these fast flowing avalanches of material called pyroclastic flows and other volcanoes like Mount Vesuvius or Mount Etna in Europe um, or other Mount Fuji in Japan um, often you get uh, pyroclastic flows associated with these explosive eruptions. Um, so volcanic hazards the ones we're going to go through just to list them first of all or the materials extruded from a volcano lava flows so I'll just list them There's five uh, volcanic ash, and we'll go through each of these in turn. Uh, lots more details on each. Uh, pyroclastic flows, lahars, an Indonesian word, by the way, meaning uh, volcanic mud flow, um, and poisonous gases. So they're the five we're going to deal with in this lecture. Uh, summarized in this diagram um, of volcanic hazards, so you can see. You know, it's, it's um, ashfall, uh, poisonous gases, that includes actually the sulfur dioxide um, helps produce acid rain, uh, pyroclastic flows flowing down the mountain at great speed, uh, lava flows, volcanic bombs, another type, a larger type of pyroclastic um, material, etc. Uh, and lahars here, these mud or debris flows. Okay, so let's start with lava. I mean, most people think of lava as the, you know, the, the main hazard associated with a volcano, and you'd be correct really in, in thinking that it is one of the, the most common hazards. Uh, the result when magma, remember, reaches the surface. So magma, when, when it reaches the surface, we simply just change the name to uh, the word lava. Um, basically it degasses, but it's still essentially the same material. It's mostly a threat to property. Remember from the beginning, a hazard uh, um, is a, a threat, a geophysical hazard or an, uh, no, a natural hazard is a threat to people, uh, to property, to wildlife. Um, this one is mostly a threat to property. Why? Generally, lava flows are pretty slow, it's quite slow moving. So therefore, you can um, kind of get out of the way of one coming, <laughs> if, if you will. Um, I always think of the lava flow coming down, down a mountainside, uh, you know, it's, it, they tend to follow a a fixed line, uh, make a right or a left and, you, and you'll be fine. <laughs> um, basaltic lava is the most abundant. So uh, remember um, with different types of volcanoes and th volcanoes like um, uh, low viscosity magmas, like in, with shield volcanoes, the main product there is more or less all lava, but, um, but also these very fluid low viscosity magmas do produce an awful lot of lava. So they're most common in the basaltic type magmas such as you get in um, oceanic settings so uh, intraflate volcanism for example such as like on Hawaii. Uh, so basaltic lava is most abundant there's two main types of basaltic lava named after the way their kind of texture and the way they flow essentially on their appearance of, of flow they're both named from um, native Hawaiian words uh, the first one is pahoi hoi uh, pronounced in, uh, in Hawaiian. I think I've got that right. Um, and the other one is in Hawaiian, aha. I generally just call it ah lava, but if you want to do it correctly, it should be a, a double ah, ah, ah. Um, so the pahoi hoi is uh, literally uh, means ropey texture in Hawaiian. That's, that's, that's how it gets its name. Um, so it's runny smooth and it kind of folds over as, as it as it flows. You can see this kind of um, folding over type texture um, in the photograph on the right there. Um, the R lava, um, uh, if you see the slides, there's a picture of it in the bottom right. Um, and this is much thicker, slower moving, um, lower temperatures generally, sort of 1000 to sort of 1100 Celsius 
um, and it's kind of thick, rough and jagged, blocky texture. Literally, the, it translates as a blocky texture, the word aha. Uh -huh. um, so here's a, a photo of uh, the Pai Hoi Hoi, or the ropey lava on um, on uh, Kilauea, on Hawaii. And you can see glowing red hot. So uh, the, the uh, Pai Hoi is typically sort of 1100 to 1200 degrees Celsius. So, you know, very high temperatures very quickly quite quickly cools right on the surface you know it's exposed to the air so it's going to cool quicker uh, and you quickly get this um black black skin or crust um of, of basaltic rock essentially minerals forming uh but still molten un, 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 underneath and this 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 material can flow um many many miles from down the flanks of these uh low angle volcanoes and sometimes we'll see they can actually flow in, in tubes under, underground in tunnels underground lava tubes uh, you can see people walking in the background, uh, shorts and sneakers. Uh, you can on Hawaii go on volcano tours and there's trails. There's pretty much on Kilauea, there's always active um, volcano uh, lava flows. It's the most active volcano on Earth. It's been erupting constantly since about 1985. Um, but as we've learned, it's not explosive in its, uh, in its eruptive behavior. So you, you're pretty much safe uh generally speaking um uh, to go up close to a lava flow but don't stand in it <laughs> it is 1100 degrees celsius <laughs> um here is uh this is a photo actually from uh um a former colleague of mine uh john nyquist at uh, temple university and he's taking a hammer to uh the bot the, um through this ropey lava um and you can see through the crust into the molten rock beneath it uh, here's an image of the blocky or aha lava, um, and again, it kind of, if you saw this in the video, you, you'd see, there are many videos on YouTube you can look at, um, it kind of, it tumbles and cascades forwards gradually as it moves uh, forward, it's pretty slow moving. Um, I always think these two guys are kind of briskly walking uh, rather than running, um, so they're, they're pretty safe. Again, though, there'll be a lot of radiant heat from this, you know, this is... <laughs> very high temperatures so um you don't really you'll you know, get quite scorched just actually literally standing very close to these things um here's some uh, geologists uh, scientists um taking samples from beneath this very thick basaltic crust on hawaii and they're taking samples from these lava tubes um underground on um either kilauea or, or mauna loa the larger volcano that on hawaii and they'll either be you know, taking samples of the, of the gases or of the actual lava itself. Um, as you can see, you can flow through these these underground tubes for actually many, many miles. And once they've evacuated the lava, you know, after the eruption, uh, they're left as tunnels. And some of the uh, um, the uh, volcano tours, you know, they advertise that fact. They can take you on trails which actually run through, uh, walk along through these, these ancient uh, lava tubes, which is kind of cool, I think. Uh, more images from Hawaii. Uh, it's a, you know it's a very volcanic island. You they live with active volcanoes constantly. So here you can see a, a, a lava flow which has gone across this roadway. So it's going to have to be kind of bulldozed out again now. But there's a lot of signage there. So here danger, hazardous fumes, steep cliffs, rough surface, hot lava, flashlight required after dark. I mean, it's, it's, you see where you, where you can stand it. Um, here's another image from Hawaii, um, image from uh, back from 1990. Um, uh, this shows from a lava flow, it's, it's ignited a building, essentially someone's home. Um, so this is how it can be, you know, a major threat to property. Uh, it's very, very hard, as we'll find out next week, uh, next, next lecture, uh, to stop a lava flow, if you will, uh, or divert a lava flow. Um, so, here the fire appliance there's a fire truck here they are they have been trying to extinguish the lava flow before it, it um, ignited this house but um to no avail unfortunately okay so that's lava what about the next uh, material uh, from a volcano um it's stuff that comes out as you can see here from mount etna this big plume of ash uh, material which is collectively called pyroclastics or pyroclastic materials literally translates as fire fragments um, and there's different types of pyroclastic debris depending on what size it is basically they're very fine like ash and there's larger uh, lumps and eventually kind of big boulder size or larger 
uh, uh, lumps which are, can be thrown out of uh, a volcano during an eruption. Remember, the amount of energy released during a large explosive eruption is absolutely immense. So it can it can huge, uh, essentially boulders and pieces of rocks the size of you know small cars, literally many many tons uh, in weight can be um, blasted out during the eruption. Um, so types of pyroclastic debris. First of all, the smaller sized material, starting from the smallest, the ash and the dust. So it's simply called volcanic ash. Um, fine glassy fragments. If you looked under ash, as we'll see uh, under a microscope, it's actually small shards of volcanic glass. Um, next size up, if it's pea-sized materials, the analogy, we call it cinders. If it's a bit, little bit larger, uh, we call it um, pumice or, or lapilli, or lapilli uh, which is a walnut size um, material, maybe an inch, size, three centimeters in diameter. And uh, then particles larger than kind of pumice size or lapilli size, um, you get either they're called, excuse me, um, blocks or bombs, depending on what was ejected from the state of the, the lava or the magma when it was ejected. Was it hardened or cooled lava? Basically, during that eruption, did a bit of pre existing rock, hard rock, uh, blasted out when the, the top of the mountain exploded essentially uh, during an eruption and that was thrown into the air? Um, or was it the actual lava itself, so hot molten material in big blobs of, of lava flying through the air, and we call those volcanic bombs. So if it's hard, pre-existing hard, hard um, rock, essentially it's, it's volcanic blocks. If it's um, um, hot lava which has been thrown through the air, ejected, it's volcanic bombs. Um, we'll come back to those. Um, so here you can see with a coin for, for, for scale, ash, the finest material, grass you get up to large material um, to pumice, often has this bleached white appearance as well, just after the eruption. Here you can see a fragment of um, ash through a very uh, powerful microscope, a scanning electron microscope. Um, this is 30 microns in scale. So this bit of ash is probably you know, no larger than the width of a human hair, it's just a single grain of ash. But if you look through a powerful microscope, you'd see it's this kind of bubbled piece of frothy glass essentially, it's volcanic glass and this is why you do not want to get volcanic ash, in, especially in large quantities into your lungs. It can cause a lot of damage to to uh, human lungs, any animal's lungs essentially, um, and death in, in large quantities. Um, there was a quite famous uh, on the news a lot a few years back, a uh, disaster tragedy in, in Japan. Um, Japan, a very volcanic uh, group of islands, uh, they live with volcanic eruptions all the time. But anyway, there was a guided tour of hikers up a mountain, uh, a volcano. They thought there was, there was no imminent danger. They didn't think that volcano was a threat, uh, but it did erupt while they were quite a high elevation. And it was a large group of hikers. We're talking, um, you know, several dozen. Um, and unfortunately, the guide had not insisted that they took masks, simple face masks. Um, and it was caught on camera with all these people's cameras dropped to the ground as a huge thick cloud of billowing um, ash uh, came came down. Um, and unfortunately, the, the, none of the, the hikers, uh, walkers survived. But uh, if they'd had simple masks, they may have um, to filter out these, these ash particles. Um, so pyroclast materials, um, ash fall itself, to talk a little bit more about that, that um, the hazard and the risks it poses. It's explosive fragmentation of magma during an eruption can cover hundreds of thousands of square miles, hundreds, sorry, hundreds or thousands of square miles. So large, you know, spatial area um, once it comes back to Earth. Um, direct hazards, vegetation can be destroyed. Um, it can contaminate uh, the, the water uh, uh, by, by, by this ash, the sediment, which will basically um, clog the, um, um, the, the gills of fish and kill uh, most actually aquatic life uh, if, if it comes down in large quantities. Um, so it's a big uh, danger to, to local ecosystems. Um, ash accumulation on roofs may cause structural damage, especially in uh, countries where you know, flat roofed buildings are more common in places like Central and South America and the volcanoes there. Uh, it's an irritation, as I said, to the respiratory system um, and, and eyes as well. And for aircraft, the engines of jet aircraft may experience what's called a flame out. If it's sucked into the jet engine, um, it will essentially put out that the combustion flame and the engine <laughs> stops working, uh, which is obviously not good. Um, so aircraft 
usually have to uh, usually take a different flight path when they know or they know they're in the vicinity of a, um, an active volcanic eruption. Um, volcanic ash, when it comes to the ground, you can see a thick deposits here on one of the mountains in uh, one of the volcanoes in the Cascades in Washington state. And you can see the particles here, different grades, fine ash, slot and some larger cinders in there. Um, here it's all been sculptured into these pinnacles, by the way, by rain. So this ash fall was maybe, uh, you know, uh, maybe a year or two ago. Um, and it's gradually been um, uh, eroded by, by rain and, and weather. Uh, here again, the same process is happening from, from the weather, but here you can see thick deposits of ash, volcanic ash, on, again on the flanks of a uh, vo volcano in Washington state in the Cascade Mountains. Uh, burial collapse, so you can, uh, when it um, on the roofs of buildings, can cause a lot of collapse. Here, a uh, big jet aircraft, passenger aircraft, here it's from the ash on the tail wings. Uh, which has caused it to upend slightly um, from the weight. A lot of very thick um, ash fall and tephra, uh, larger grade material on um, buildings here in Iceland, this, this image is from. So Iceland, another very volcanic ice, um, island uh, island in the, in the North Atlantic, you know, on a divergent spreading center. And also, but actually, there's a hot spot beneath Iceland as well. Um, and here you can see most of the ash on these, you know, steep roof buildings is kind of slid off, uh, but there's very thick accumulations here, which is going to be, um, you know, a, a huge deal to, to, um, excavate, um, um, for this town. Uh, so volcanic eruptions can get very large and these ash clouds and plumes can get very large with it. Here's the, the eruption of uh, Mount Redoubt in Alaska back in 19. 19, this big mushroom cloud as it goes up into the stratosphere. Um, and a similar, another image of that same eruption might be doubt in Alaska. And here you can see the big volcanic uh, ash plume um, being here streaming off into one direction, uh, simply caused by the prevailing wind in that, in that direction. So as I said, aircraft, um, this ash in, in the atmosphere is a big hazard for aircraft, um, especially jet aircraft. Um, and here, uh, but unfortunately, there's a very active chains of uh, volcanic active volcanoes, uh, just where most of the flights go from the west coast of, of the America of North America across to uh, places like Japan and, and East, East Asia. A lot of them do because of the shape of the, the globe, they go in a big arc um, to the north and their path takes them directly across the Aleutian Islands, which is one long chain of volcanic uh, peaks associated with the subduction zone and then also across uh, the, the active volcanoes of Kamchatka in eastern Russia and the Kuril Islands and into Japan itself. So many of these planes do have to either change altitude to higher altitude or change their flight path uh, because of um, an, an ongoing eruption. A famous eruption happened in Europe or affected Europe in from an eruption in Iceland. Um, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce this, it's, the last bit is Jokul, <laughs> that's all I know. Uh, you can try it at home. Um, so this is from the uh, um, volcanic eruption of 2010. And this is a very big eruption for, quite a violent eruption for Iceland, because Iceland is not generally in qu quite quieter style eruptions. Um, but this one, there's quite a lot of ash and a lot of material was ejected and it lasted for quite some time. Um, it was erupting for quite a few days, uh, constantly. And the wind blew, which shows in, in the uh, bottom right here image, uh, the wind blew a uh, weather map here, radar map of this plume of ash material in the atmosphere across the British Isles, and then onwards across Scandinavia, Northern Europe, and even in, to, as far as Southern Europe, this ash. And this actually caused airspace to be closed down for more than a week um, at this time. Uh, myself, I was actually living in 2010 in, in the United States. Uh, it wasn't too much on the news back then, but I know it was reading the uh, the British press at the time. Uh, it was a big news in, in Europe because um, literally um, all aircraft were, were grounded for a week because of because of this one um, week long eruption of of the volcano in, in Iceland. Uh, yeah, more images from that that event. Uh, volcanic ash shuts down air travel again from, from the one volcano. Um, here, an image from the a satellite image for, of the uh, the ash plume coming directly from the volcano. And here on the right, uh, the red indicates total closure of of, of airspace, and the the other colour is partial colour, partial closure. Uh, the orange.
to most of Europe essentially was shut down as far as aircraft. Okay, so that's Ash. What about large material? Uh, volcanic bombs and uh, volcanic blocks. Remember the two two terms. Um, so here you can see, you know, materials during a volcanic eruption comes up through the vent and up, then blasts out the crater and materials that are ejected into the into the air. And um, while that's happening, large fragments of pre-existing rock on the vent side and the crater side can be blasted out, and they are the blocks, the pre-existing hardened rock, but also there's, there's molten rock also being thrown out, and that, that forms uh, the volcanic um, bombs. BGS, by the way, is the uh, uh, so the United States has the the U.S. Geological Survey. BGS stands for British Geological Survey. Um, I was just going back to well that image uh, back. You would have seen a, a, um, some of the blocks. By the way, was literally about three meters wide. They looked like marbles, but they were huge in reality. So here's a, a volcanic block, solid fragments ejected from a volcano during explosive eruption. You can see the angularity of, of them generally. Here's a, a geologic hammer for scale. Volcanic bombs are very distinct in their shape. Um, so volcanic bombs, these are molten blobs essentially of lava thrown out of a volcano during the eruption. So it's still in molten state. And as they fly through the air, they're cooling very, very quickly in, into solid rock. But as they do so, they get this aerodynamic often tear, tear, uh, you know, teardrop shaped uh, or, or sometimes kind of a, a, a American football or rugby ball shaped um, outline to them. Uh, typically, I've seen many actually in the lab that they're kind of, um, they are literally very the same size as, for example, uh, an American uh, football. Um, but here you can see, as I say, you can get this, this streamlined shape. Here there's a smaller one, you can see a coin uh, for scale. But they get bigger. Here's one 10 centimeters long on the left there, so uh, sort of four inches or so. And one on the bottom right, again, if you can't see uh, because of the image of me in the corner there, if you could look at the, the slides, uh, you will see there's a person for scale, scale stood in the right. So this uh, volcanic bomb um, was this guy, you can just see his head there. If he was maybe, I don't know, six feet or so in feet, maybe 12, 13 feet in diameter. So you do not want to be, uh, you know, on the ground wherever that lands, obviously. Um, but again, shows the amount of energy released during volcanic eruption. Um, okay, so other material associated with pyroclastics, and these are pyroclastic flows. So these are the big, these uh, very fast moving, uh, deadly avalanches. So there's an image on the right of this very fast flowing, um, um, superheated uh, vol um, uh, debris flow, essentially a volcanic debris flow or, de or volcanic avalanche. And uh, it's one of the most lethal aspects of volcanic eruptions. It actually causes more deaths um, during the eruption itself than any other uh, volcanic hazard. Um, so it's made of, what are they? They're made of superheated gases infused with um, ash and other debris. So it's a big a mixture of both. And they race down the volcano the flanks of the volcano at speeds of up to 700 miles per hour. So you cannot outrun one or even outdrive one. Um, temperatures can reach and exceed 1000 degrees Celsius, so 1800 degrees Fahrenheit or thereabouts. Um, and I like to say that um, they're very deadly. They're often called um, glowing avalanches or glowing debris flows uh, or glowing clouds, sorry. Uh, literally translated from the French, uh, Nuit Ardente, uh, which is glowing cloud. Um, simply because you can actually, even during daylight hours at night, you can see, you know, they, they, they glow absolutely as they come down the, from the heat uh, a mountainside. But even during daylight hours, you can see they glow slightly often um, from the immense heat inside these clouds. Uh, catastrophic if populated areas are in its path. Uh, and, uh, and like I said, they're responsible for more deaths than any other hazard actually during the eruption, the hazards during the eruption. Um, yeah, basically, you know, you're going to get asphyxiated from all the ash and, and the gases are, you know, very high in, in, in carbon dioxide, for example. So you asphyxi asphyxiated any animal, uh, human or other animal, and um, incinerated. <laughs> so you, you, any animal, human, has, and plant has no chance in, um, in the path of these pyroclastic flows. Uh, the formation of different uh, ways where we think that they're formed or we observe them being formed. Sometimes, like Mount St. Helens, from lateral blasts, 
or smaller lateral blasts. But often, most commonly, they're from uh, lava dome collapses. So the, a very thick congealed lava dome, and that collapses, and that, that ensues um, this uh, pyroclastic flow afterwards. More images of pyroclastic flows. Here's one from um, a Central American uh, eruption. Um, and you can see the eruption column going vertically up. Uh, but here, a pyroclastic flow coming down the flanks um, of the, uh, the volcano here. Another one from Chile in South America, this image, a uh, volcano in the Andes, uh, Southern Andes. And here you can see this very large, but pyroclastic fl um, flow, this, um, um, this glowing cloud near our dons, um, going down the mountainside. Again, a great speed, several hundred miles per hour. And they don't often go just straight in one direction. They, they can actually be unpredictable. Uh, they can move almost at right angles, sort of dog leg to one side. Um, so. Um, Again, which is a great hazard to anyone in, in its path. Um, here's another image of taken of a pyroclastic flow from uh, Japan, Mount Unzen eruption in 1991. Uh, Mount Unzen's actually erupted a couple of times since then, but during the 1991 eruption, here you can see a very fast moving uh, debris, quite frightening to look at these things when, they, when you see them in a video uh, coming down. Here you can see a uh, um, it's an ambulance uh, driving away in the opposite direction. Uh, this was tragic, actually, for uh, two famous geologists at the time. Um, they were called um, a, a couple, a married couple, Katia and Maurice Kraft. They were French volcanologists, um, and they were pioneers at the time, in, right through the 1980s and into, up to 1991, in filming pyroclastic flows and other hazards, but especially pyroclastic flows, and getting very up, up close to, to, to these events and getting very good footage of them uh, and their behavior. Uh, but unfortunately, this one, um, they got too close uh, and they both perished uh, during the Mount London eruption from a pyroclastic flow, which is tragic. They're only in their, in their 40s um, in terms of age. Uh, Pompeii, the famous eruption, which I'm sure you've all heard of, um, hopefully um, uh, that happened in, uh, you know, um, Roman Empire, uh, Roman Italy, um, um, when Mount Vesuvius then, still a very active volcano in Europe, um, erupted. Uh, Mount Vesuvius has been uh, you know, erupting, essentially, we know from geologic history, um, um, something like 50 times over the last few hundred thousand years. But anyway, one of the large eruptions happened in AD 79, a very large eruption. Um, and uh, basically, the, it, we haven't had such a large eruption since. Um, and it was thought to be about the equivalent of three times the size of Mount St. Helens. And the ancient town of Roman town of Pompeii was near the foot of um, um, uh, the, the volcano Vesuvius at the time. And it was completely consumed mainly by, we think, pyroclastic flows that blasted through uh, the, the ancient Roman cities. We think about 15,000 people died. Basically, the whole population of, the, of that town uh, would, would die within minutes. Um, and these classic images you see of people in uh, kind of in their final seconds, uh, the death throes, um, you know, kind of shielding from the, the extreme heat uh, when these flows came through. Um, and these were discovered back in the, the, this ancient Roman town was first discovered by archaeologists uh, back in 1748 um, when uh, archaeologists were on a dig back in then. Um, and they started to find cavities under the ash deposits. They were slowly, meticulously, you know, excavating out. And these cavities, they found human bones in. And they started to realize these cavities were worthy, basically, the shape of the mold of, of, of people. Um, so what they cleverly did to, to reconstruct the people um, was pour plaster into the cavities. Um, so so um, sort of mold and cast type thing. Um, and that's what you have in the images here. So these aren't statues, if you will. These are kind of created by, by uh, plaster casts, essentially, of um, uh, these people. Um, and they show the, the images of them underground. And thousands of bodies have been found. But not just that. Basically, the whole Roman city from AD 79 was you know, stopped in time. Um, so it was quite a treasure trove as well as far as archaeology about, you know, of what the life in a Roman city back then, in the first century AD. <clears throat> yep. 
Okay. Um, uh, Mount Vesuvius, um, just saying that it hasn't erupted. I've made a note uh, since 1944. So it hasn't erupted since the last one, 1944. But there is a large, you know, large towns. Naples is near Mount Vesuvius. A lot of volcanic volcanoes occur in quite highly populated countries like Italy or Japan or the countries of South America. Remember, a lot of these hazards are associated near the coast. That's where people live uh, all, all around the world, uh, near the coast generally. Uh, here's another classic example, textbook uh, case study of a, um, a volcanic um, pyroclastic flow disaster. Um, and this occurred um, on the island of Montserrat in the Caribbean. So here's an image from 1902. And, um, and the capital city of Montserrat then, uh, Saint Pierre, and the uh, mountain behind it is uh, Mount Pele. I think it's Mount Pele. The next slide gives, gives you the name of the, um, the, the volcano. Um, and there it is, 1902. You can see the age from the, you know, it's still got tall ships in the harbour then, quite densely populated town. Okay, the next slide will show you, so remember that, uh, the next slide is showed you afterwards. Yeah, it was Mount Pele erupted in the same year, 1902. And pyroclastic flows travel directly through those huge clouds of debris and superheated ash and, and gases directly through Saint Pierre. And the city was completely destroyed, you can see from that image. Uh, 28,000 people died, the whole population essentially of that thing. It was a tragedy, or, you know, catastrophe at the time. Um, and um, uh, uh, Montserrat, uh, it's quite a small island. Um, it's still this, this, these volcanoes on Montserrat are still very, very active. So um, it's a very um, hazardous place to, to live, essentially. Um, OK, here's pyroclastic flow deposits. You can see you often have this kind of bleached white uh, once they cool down quickly after um, they stop, essentially. And here's the front of a pyroclastic flow, the toe, it's called. Again, this is again from uh, South America, again from another eruption in Chile. Okay, next hazard is lahars. Um, so lahars are, are literally an Indonesian word meaning volcanic mud flows. It's from Indonesia because um, actually it's uh, near subduction zones in Indonesia and there's a lot of explosive eruptions. Um, but also in Indonesia, it's very, very high rainfall. You have you know, rainforests there in, in, in places like Borneo, etc. Um, and that, as we'll see on this slide, uh, helps create um, lahars. Um, so just like normal uh, mud flows. So they're a mixture of volcanic debris, ash mainly, and water. And they're associated with these composite, explosive uh, composite cone volcanoes, where you have large amounts of pyroclastics associated with them. They process ash. So what happens is you have ash accumulating on the volcano's flank during an, uh, during an eruption. And then heavy rains, all melted snow, uh, remember, the volcanoes are high, and during an eruption, it can cause floods and snow melt. Actually, during the eruption, from you know, from the heat of the event, um, but also you can have snow melt. You know, generally you know, in the spring, summer months um, on these volcanoes. Either way, so as during the eruption or later on in the year, that water will consaturate these thick layers of unconsolidated ash and create a mud flow, and these mud flows can move down valley valleys and volcanic slopes with very destructive uh, results. So the thing about lahars, they don't, they're not just a hazard like all the others associated with the volcanic eruption itself. They can happen during a volcanic eruption or straight afterwards, but also they can happen at any time uh, later in the year or even several years later, while the ash is still kind of unconsolidated and easily uh, mobilized from, from rain, from heavy rains. So they're very common in the tropics in places like Indonesia, in places like Central America, uh, where you have, on South America, where you have high rainfall. Often they, they flow, we have consistency of um, wet concrete, so the liquid, uh, as they flow, but as soon as they stop, they actually set, literally like concrete, to a solid uh, very quickly. Uh, here's an image of, which shows how high the volcanic mud, uh, mud flows, uh, lahars, were associated with the uh, 1980 St. Helens eruption. Here you can see is a person to scale uh, here in the in the right um, how high that they got up up these um, you know up, up the tree trunks here, and they brought down a huge huge amount of energy when they bring they come down these these, these flows, um, they brought all these these um, debris and tree trunks with them. 
uh, do watch in your own time. Go back to the slides and watch this. It's only about a minute long. But it, it shows a nice uh, clip of a moving lahar um, from Indonesia, uh, from the Mount Sumeru eruption of 2003. And it just it, it just shows you, illustrates the energy. It's, wor it's worth your while watching that one. And the speed at which it's not a normal river flow. Do watch it. It's, you know, it's essentially almost like a, a semi-solid avalanche with a little bit of water in it. Uh, so when these things uh, stop, they set. Um, um, so here in uh, uh, Lahar, associated with um, actually a, a Mount Rainier um, eruption in, in uh, Washington State, um, and here you can see a U.S. Uh, mailbox for scale. So the, you know the ash flow here, Lahar, sorry, may be a meter, three feet, maybe I'm guessing uh, thick, um, and then it's going to set to a solid. It'll gradually dry out. Pretty, pretty, pretty quickly, you can see someone's walked across the footprints um, across the top. Uh, there's that there's someone's house there, and that, basically, I think that house is um, it's not worth <laughs> excavating. It's it's essentially um, you know, you know um, rebuilt. Um, so the hearts are, are both a danger to people and the property very much. So anything in their path, it will destroy as far as uh, buildings and property, and also any people. Who get um, caught up in lahars, like normal river floods, but especially lahars, even more so. Um, it's incredibly hard to get out of them, and if not impossible, um, uh, once you get caught up in these these lahars. Um, this is another basically as, as big as it gets as far as um, dis natural disasters associated with very specifically with these lahar floods. Um, and this happened um, back in 1985 in Colombia, in South America, the Nevada del Ruiz. Uh, volcanic eruption. Um, this is a volcanic map which was actually produced after the eruption by US Geological Survey scientists went down there and mapped out kind of the different hazards that was called a hazard map of the different hazards associated with volcanoes. So you have the dark brown the lava flows nearest the peak, um, the lighter brown pyroclastic flows um, uh, and the yellow kind of moderate pyroclastic flows. But down these river valleys they can act as natural conduits for to direct um, mud flows hazards um, and some pyroclastics in yellow, but especially mud flows, these lahars. Um, and here in the, the darker kind of orangey brown uh, mud flows from the November 985 eruption. And it smashed right through this small town, or quite large town actually, of, of Armiro Ar 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 in, um, in downstream of the, the volcano. And we're talking, you know, the scale here is in kilometers, uh, you know, 15, 30, 45 kilometers, 30 miles away, something like that. Um, it's, it's a long way. That volcano was way out of sight of the people of Armiro. Um, they did not think a mud flow of, of you know, Lahar of, of such violence would come down that, 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 that valley, but it did. Um, 25,000 people, 25,000 people died. Uh, it could have been prevented. There are ways to actually uh, have warnings for Lahars, um, certainly since this event, but also simply mapping the hazards before, you know, um, um, and realizing that you're in danger, the town it has, you know, a high chance at a high recurrence interval of Lahars reaching that point. They're very recognizable deposits, so you can see all the hard deposits, this tumble of uh, boulders and rock. Um, so basically, um, building your towns off the, the valley floor itself and on slightly higher ground, and that's all it takes, just on slightly higher ground, and, and you're in a safer, safe zone. <coughs> um, here is an um, image of Armeiro itself and the volcanic uh, debris. You know, you can't see there's mountains around, but you can't actually see the uh, Nevada de Ruiz uh, volcano. It's way 30 miles, as I could say, 45 kilometers upstream, uh, but it's huge. Um, the volume of volcanic mud was was came down and smashed through this town, hence the very high death toll um, in this town. So this, if they built this town on higher ground, there would have been very much 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 fewer deaths. Um, and going back to the, uh, the way of actually um, after this event, really actually now in the nineteen ninety from the nineteen nineties onwards. Um, we have developed ways in which we can have an early warning system for Lahars. It was developed with Mount Rainier originally in mind, which is a volcanic uh, volcano near um, the south of um, um, Seattle in Washington State, in the United States. 
and it develops in 1995. And what it does is basically detects uh, these um, the detects using a network of small sensors called acoustic flow monitors embedded underground to measure ground vibrations made by a passing lahar. This lahar is a very huge, dense boulders and rock and water flowing down. It has a much different vibration pattern than, say, a river flood. And these detectors um, can pick up that and give warning. And typically, you know, down river of these things where towns may be, you may have a 40 minute warning, you may have three hours warning. They travel a long way, these lahars. Um, so a couple of hours warning is hopefully good enough to, uh, time if, it, if it's set up in place a, a, a warning system to evacuate a town very, very rapidly. Um, and they have here's a Mount Rainier volcanic hazard map. So um, Seattle is, is in the north here uh, um, near the Puget Sound um, and different, different small towns as well. But you can see different streams and hazards associated which move along here, especially Lahar hazards, which come down the valleys from Mount Rainier. And these have all been mapped out and towns like Orting, etc. Are, are in the path of Lahars, uh, which may only be recurrence of interval, you know, sometimes less than 100, but may only be every 300 years. But it's still a risk. They're deadly when they come through. So, and it's not every 300 years. It might be one every 30 years and not another one for 500 years. You know, it's on average. So, um, every uh, this, uh, every 300 years. So even what I would say, you know, it's, it's again to do with risk analysis and human perception of risk of, of uh, is an event every 300 years worth spending an awful lot of money on relocating your high your town on higher ground spending about a million million dollars uh, to set up a warning system i believe it's about a thousand um uh, uh dollars per year to, to kind of maintain these systems but i think yes it's i think it's money well spent because of the the unknown um nature of volcanic eruptions and the timing of them uh poisonous gases um so volcanic hazards those are the ones we're going to look at um so um this is the last one you be glad to hear. Um, so poisonous gases include, um, well, gases that come out include uh, water vapor, but the more poisonous ones are um, carbon dioxide, um, sulfur dioxide, uh, carbon monoxide, which if you know is it's, it's deadly, um, and hydrogen sulfide, the kind of smelly rotten eggs ones that you're often associated with. Again, the sulfurish, sulfur ones are, um, are, are quite you know, quite noxious um, odor. Um, Carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, though, you, there is no odour whatsoever, which is what makes both of these gases, carbon monoxide, in very, very small quantities, it, it's deadly, uh, with asphyxiate you. Um, but carbon dioxide, um, it's naturally, you know, it's naturally in the, in, in the atmosphere, about 0.04%, very small amount. But, um, um, but if you go up to high concentrations, which are emitted during volcanic eruptions sometimes, uh, right about six, seven percent, eight percent. Well, it's gonna, you're going to pass out, and once it gets to kind of ten, twelve percent CO two, um, you're dead <laughs> um, from that concentration. And you do get those concentrations of carbon dioxide associated with volcanic eruptions seeping out of um, uh, cracks and fissures in the ground. Um, acid rain forms uh, when mixed with water, so hydrogen sulfide uh, gases. Well, that's ha ha mixed with uh, water in the atmosphere that produces um, sulfuric acid, H2SO4. Um, and SO2, so, um, uh, and that water can affect uh, acidify lakes and aquatic life can cause a danger too, for example. Um, and groundwater can be acidified from this sulfuric acid. But also sulfur dioxide can produce um, acid rain, usually downwind of, that well, is downwind of, of um, the eruption. Um, but um, which could, which could be an issue. Examples: uh, the acid rain, the bottom there, Mount Katmai um, eruption from Alaska. You don't hear much about Mount, Kat Mount Katmai, but it was the largest volcanic eruption of the 20th century. Uh, Mount Pinatubo, which is a which is talked about a lot because um, uh, because of the large evacuation that took place at the time and there were many deaths. Uh, still though, uh, that happened in um, the Philippines, that's the second most largest eruption of the 20th century, but the largest was Mount Katmai. Not known about so much because uh, it was up in Alaska during a very, you know, Alaska was a very small population uh, back then. 
and uh, very few of um i think very few only talking a handful of people actually um died if not witnessed it uh but lake nios in cameroon this was a very large disaster probably the, the largest event natural disaster associated with uh gases or uh, coming from a volcano it happened in 1986 and 1700 people died of asphyxiation from carbon dioxide in this one event um so what happens here it's, um it's in the rift valleys of um sorry volcano in in, in west africa in cameroon um and in lake naos and here you can see crater crater lake um associated with this volcano it's not terribly active a volcano it doesn't erupt often but it does have magma you know it is an active volcano but it erupts quite rarely it does have active uh, magmatic or magma underground and associated with that magma is constantly you're going to have gases uh, volcanic gases being gradually seeping to the surface and what happens here is this during in lake nios carbon dioxide was gradually uh, um, being emitted and coming up through the vents and cracks at the base bottom of this lake it's quite deep lake a couple of hundred feet deep um and but it was actually staying in the cold still water down there basically that the bottom layer of water is becoming what we call super saturated in gases in carbon co2 essentially a big kind of pool of co2 at the bottom of the lake what happened in 1986 was there was a, a small earthquake and a landslide associated with it on the edge of this crater lake that landslide caused disruption to the lake upturned the stratification of the lake and it released this big volume of, of co2 which had been up near the lake bottom and that co2 cloud came up over kind of the the, uh, the crater edges here and down the flanks of the mountains in all directions no one knew this was happening completely invisible deadly killer this cloud of co2 uh, and this is what happened to cattle coming down it asphyxiated these um on its way down something like 3,000 uh, livestock cattle mainly um, died from this event another image of again a herd of cattle um, asphyxiated from this, this event but people also going back to you know from now 1700 people died um, I've moved on a slide but still talking about the previous slides um, Lake Nios uh, it isn't so dangerous there now because what they've done since um, 2001 they've um, they put the tubes down from kind of floating areas, basically the tubes down from the lake top down to the lake bed, and they're constantly siphoning up any gases. So gases are not building up there. So um, essentially that large event of 1986 won't happen again, um, the, the way they're managing it there, um, which is good, obviously. Uh, California in the United States, um, another area of Kind of um, um, uh, mammoth lakes in kind of the middle of, of uh, um, California, sort of East California. Um, not generally associated with lots of active volcanoes, but again, you have still magma, deeply rooted magma underground, and again, you have associated with that um, CO2 and other gases coming out. And here, a big, you know, it's big tourism in industry on Mammoth Mountain and uh, area of Mammoth Lakes, uh, or skiing, hiking, you know, uh, fishing, etc associated with the park and, and the area around it but there is an ongoing hazard there in that there are gases and that builds up in these depressions and in back in the um 1990s i believe it was mid 1990s there were two um two guys uh um uh, camping outdoors uh essentially in, in uh, just bivy bags uh in a depression unfortunately and they didn't wake up they were succeeded but by CO2 but and now in all buildings any within the park or vicinity all have uh, in the basements monitors for CO2 as well so, um, um, here you can see it causes in high concentrations in the soil um, it will actually cause the death of trees and vegetation and you'll see that in various parts around the park uh, often these areas where there's gases coming we call them the actual vent uh, where the gases come out we call them a fumarole uh, there's the word fumarole and they emit only gases and smoke so these types of conduits then don't lava doesn't come out it's only gas and he can see the yellow coloration of uh, crystals of, of sulfur uh, minerals forming around the edge you know the entrance of these fumaroles 
here um, again a mammoth lake area in, in California you can see there is a danger carbon dioxide hazard area ahead again in depressions um, and you can, you can see the, the, the killing off of trees caused by um, high, high levels of CO2 in, in the soil here coming up all right so that's going to finish that one we finished about on time um, and just to summarize all those hazards again there's that image again of the different ones we've covered today so of ash pyroclastics, pyroclastic flows, lava, lahars, gases. We kind of covered them all really today. All right, um, final slide. Um, but as I've mentioned throughout really so far, people, um, we have to kind of live with volcanoes often. Places like Japan, Iceland, uh, you know, um, they, they, there's nowhere else to go. <laughs> there, there's volcanoes there uh, always. So you really have to live with these hazards associated with volcanic eruptions and in the united states in the cascade mountains or in washington state certainly here's an image of seattle in the foreground the famous space needle tower on the right there um but mount rainier in the background it's very close it has those laha issues but also it goes off it erupts uh, not often but it does erupt every couple of centuries and uh, when it goes off it you know it's large eruptions we know um and therefore it's again uh we have to learn to live with hazards it's all about forecasting the eruption and so the next lecture the final lecture on on volcanoes will be all about how we forecast eruptions are they what we call precursors which are signs that something's going on underground signs that we may have a volcanic eruption about to happen and then if we do we can take action evacuate um etc just get, get in, in emergency services into a state of readiness etc Okay, thank you guys, and uh, thanks for joining this lecture, and I'll see you next time. Thanks.